Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. To determine what was Canada's greatest song, I ran a poll from December 2023 to May 2024 on my Twitter, X, and Threads profiles. I started with 300 songs of every genre and created a cross-section of 70 years of Canadian music. Over those five months, there were nine rounds of voting and 1.5 million votes cast. And it all came down to one winning song that told the story of a legend that lives on from the Chippewa on down to the big lake they call Gitchigumi. One that any Canadian could recognize instantly by its haunting opening chords. It was written and performed by one of our greatest singer-songwriters, Gordon Lightfoot, as he sings of a lake that never gave up its dead when the November skies turned gloomy. Next time you listen to the song, no, there is much more to the tale than the ending. I'm Craig Baird, this is Canadian History X, and today we're sailing on a doomed American ship. This is the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Right from the start of European exploration, the Great Lakes have always been a dangerous place for ships. The immense waters have been known to swallow ships up. And I don't mean that in an abstract or metaphorical sense either. Literally, the Great Lakes sank the first large European ship to sail on their waters. Le Griffin departed on its maiden voyage on Lake Erie on August 7, 1679, with René Robert Cavalier at the helm and sailed to Lake Huron and Lake Michigan through mostly uncharted waters. After landing in an island near modern-day Green Bay, it loaded up with furs and sailed back towards Niagara on September 18th. The ship and its crew were never seen again. The Great Lakes had claimed their first victims, but not their last. The exact number isn't known because so many ships have simply vanished. It's estimated more than 25,000 ships have been lost on those inland seas with 6,000 to 30,000 dead. One of the worst incidents on the Great Lakes happened in 1913. A storm with gale force winds up to 127 kilometers an hour hit from November 7th to November 10th of that year and sank ships on four of the five lakes. 19 ships were destroyed and 19 others stranded and $1 million in cargo was lost and more than 250 people killed. The storm remains the deadliest and most destructive natural disaster in recorded history on the lakes. Then there's the story from November 29, 1966, when the SS Daniel J. Morrill broke in half in a storm. As the surviving passengers huddled up on the bow that remained afloat, they saw in the distance another ship approaching. They believed they were about to be rescued, only to discover that it was the ship's aft section barreling towards them under the power of its ship's engines. Both sections soon sank. Only one person survived. Writer William Rattigan said that the vessel's aft section disappeared into the darkness like a great wounded beast with its head cut off. I always found that story rather unsettling. Now if you weren't aware of the deadly nature of the Great Lakes, I don't blame you. Most would have a tough time naming a ship lost in the treacherous waters. Except for marine historians, these shipwrecks don't have the same name recognition as oceanic ones like the Titanic, the Lusitania, or the Empress of Ireland. That all being said, there is likely one ship nearly all of us, especially Canadians, can name. It is the most famous of the Great Lakes ships, due to the tragic ending of its final voyage, the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Edmund Fitzgerald was a legend long before it became a story of tragedy and loss. Once called the Queen of the Lakes, she was the largest ship to sail the Great Lakes when she launched in 1959, although her reign was relatively short because soon after, the SS Murray Bay set sail and exceeded her in size. Regardless, the Edmund Fitzgerald was the largest to ever be lost on the lakes, and her story begins in 1957 when the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company began to heavily invest in iron and minerals. The Milwaukee-based company had been around for a hundred years as an insurance company, but wanted to diversify its portfolio, which led them into shipping. 
It was the first life insurance company to make such an investment, and they contracted the Great Lakes Engineering Works to build a ship for transporting ore. And if they were going to have a ship, they were going to go big or go home. This new ship would feature three central cargo holds which were loaded through 21 watertight cargo hatches. Each of these hatches was 3.4 by 14.6 meters in size with 7.9 millimeters thick steel. It was to be 225 meters long, 23 meters wide, and capable of carrying 26,000 long tons of cargo. The company requested that it be built within 30 centimeters of the maximum length allowed for passage through the St. Lawrence Seaway so it could barely travel from Lake Superior to the Atlantic Ocean. Easily the biggest ship on the Great Lakes with a propeller that weighed 27 tons and was 6 meters in diameter. And in all, this behemoth cost $7 million to make. She was only 40 meters shorter than the famous Titanic whose heart goes on through pop culture. The Edmonton Fitzgerald may have been an iron or a hauler, but for those who would work through the long days and nights crossing the Great Lakes, it was a lap of luxury. Employees enjoyed pile carpeting, tiled bathrooms, drapes over portholes, and leather chairs in the lounge. The galley included two dining rooms, and there was even air conditioning for the crew. She was given the name of Edmund Fitzgerald, in honor of the president and chairperson of the board of the Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company. Now Fitzgerald had a strong connection to the Great Lakes. His grandfather and all his great uncles had been captains. His father had also built and repaired ships. Little did he know, his name would become synonymous with the legendary Great Lakes tragedy one day. Ken Garland, the mechanical superintendent of Great Lakes Engineering Works, couldn't hold in his excitement the day before the launch. He said, We are so proud of her. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't that a dandy looking stern? I won't sleep tonight. That's how worried I am. None of us will sleep. It isn't that we're really expecting anything to go wrong, but there's always the chance. The big day came in the spring of 1958. Now, I'm not a superstitious man. Yes, I don't wash my Edmonton Oilers jersey during the playoffs, but that isn't superstition. That's science. However, if I were a believer in bad omens and superstitions, I may have been a bit worried following the launch of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Here's why. On June 7, 1958, 15,000 people gathered at the Milwaukee Dry Dock to watch the great ship enter the water for the first time. Elizabeth Fitzgerald, Edmund's spouse, took a bottle of champagne and smacked it against the bow of the ship to christen it. The breaking of champagne over the bow of a ship is meant to bring good fortune on voyages. The practice evolved from the Vikings who sacrificed slaves or goats to win favor with the sea god. By the 15th century, a representative of the King of England would name a ship, drink a goblet of wine and sprinkle the remains over the deck at four points, then would throw the goblet overboard. At the turn of the 18th century, that ceremony had evolved into smashing a bottle of champagne over the bow. The problem is, when Elizabeth Fitzgerald hit the ship with the bottle, it didn't break. She tried again. Same result. There was probably some murmuring in the crowd that such a thing was a bad omen. Finally, on the third try, Elizabeth broke the bottle, and the crowd cheered. Now the ship was ready, and as the behemoth slid into the Great Lakes for the first time, another cheer erupted. That cheer soon turned into screams, as the ship produced a massive wave that swamped the spectators, knocking them off their feet and pulling them towards the water where the great ship seemed to be thrashing. One man in the crowd suffered a heart attack and later died, and in the chaos, the ship hit the pier. To the spectators, it seemed like the ship was trying to climb out of the water. Not a great start, but once she started hauling ore, she was almost perfect. On September 22, 1958, she began nine days of trials before starting her life on the Great Lakes. While the ship was built by Northwestern Mutual, its day-to-day -day operation was under Oglebay Norton Corporation, who signed a 25-year contract, and the ship became the flagship of their Columbia Transportation Fleet. For the first decade of her service, it was considered one of the safest of the Great Lakes. She was nicknamed the Fitz, Pride of the American Side, Mighty Fitz, Toledo Express, Big Fitz, and in hindsight, the unfortunate moniker of the Titanic of the Great Lakes. On each of her trips, she took four and a half hours to load and 14 hours to unload. Usually, she was going back and forth between Superior, Wisconsin, and Detroit, Michigan, a trip that took five days. And people actively tried to see the ship when it was near. 
Her captain at the time, Captain Peter Pulser, blasted music over the ship's intercom system for the crowds while passing through the St. Clair or Detroit rivers. When he passed through the Sioux locks, he came out of the bunkhouse with a bullhorn to entertain tourists with facts and a running commentary on details relating to the great ship. By 1969, the Edmund Fitzgerald was celebrating eight straight years without injury. She also set a record for a single trip by carrying 27,402 long tons of ore. But from then on, fortunes began to sour. In 1969, she briefly ran aground. That same year, she had a diesel-powered bow thruster installed to improve maneuverability. A year later, she suffered a minor collision with the SS Hochelega. Then, that same year, she struck the wall of a lock, something she repeated in 1973 and 1974. In 1974, she lost her original bow anchor in the Detroit River. All these incidents were relatively minor, and passed off as little more than the occasional bad luck or mishap. By 1975, she had completed 748 round trips of the Great Lakes, covering a distance equal to 44 trips around the world. She also continued to take on passengers, including the occasional company guest. A man who sailed on her, Frederick Stonehouse, said, Stewards treated the guests of the entire VIP routine. The cuisine was reportedly excellent and snacks were always available in the lounge. A small but well-stocked kitchenette provided the drinks. Once each trip, the captain held a candlelight dinner for the guests, complete with mess-jacketed stewards and special clam digger punch. Most Great Lakes ships had about a half century of life in them, and the Emin Fitzgerald was barely middle-aged, despite her many voyages. And as she prepared to depart on her 749th trip, the winds of fate were converging to ensure she never saw 750. In November, Storms off the Great Lakes tend to be especially bad. This has been seen time and time again. On November 11, 1835, a storm led to dozens of deaths and the loss of numerous ships. The 1905 Blow, a storm that raged from November 27th to 28th, destroyed or damaged 29 vessels and killed 39 people. The Great Lakes Storm of 1913, which I already mentioned, killed 250. The Armistice Day Blizzard of 1940 sank three ships lost in the storm. Storms during the 11th month of the year are known as the Witches of November, which you can hear in Lightfoot's song in the line, "'Twas the Witch of November come stealing." There's a reason these storms are so destructive. And to answer that, we need to do some meteorology. Arctic air moves down into the Rocky Mountains and the Prairie Provinces. At the same time, warm air and a lot of moisture comes up from the Gulf of Mexico. This gulf air creates a low-pressure system that rides along the edge of the Arctic air masses. Blocked by the Rocky Mountains in the west, the low-pressure system then hitches a ride on the jet stream heading east towards the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes in November still have some warmth that late in the year, so when the low-pressure system reaches the Great Lakes, it causes storms to intensify and birth the Witches of November. These storms feature gale-force winds, blinding snow, and bitterly cold temperatures. Before those forces converge, though, the weather is often calm and lovely, giving a false sense of security to ship captains who sail out into a waiting disaster. Ernest McSorley was at the helm of the Edmund Fitzgerald on November 9, 1975. Born in Spencerville, Ontario in 1912, he moved to the United States with his family when he was 11 and fell in love with being on the water. Over the next 40 years, he became a veteran sailor on the Great Lakes and the world's oceans. That experience meant he was respected as being a skillful master. A quiet man, he always treated those on his ship as professionals, which resulted in loyal crews. And as he stood on the ship looking out at Lake Superior, he likely thought about his upcoming retirement. Now 63, he planned to walk away at the end of the shipping season and return to his home in Ottawa Hills, Ohio, where his wife Nellie awaited. They had no children and Nellie was in ill health, so it would be good to spend some time with her. Or at least, that was the plan. The ship was loaded with 26,116 long tons of taconite ore pellets, and the crew was eager to get going. A Witch of November was expected, but the storm was predicted to pass south of Lake Superior by 7 a.m. the next day. If it did, it wouldn't pose much of a problem for the Queen of the Lakes. But as the day wore on, things took a turn. Gale warnings were issued for all of Lake Superior by 7 p.m., 
McSorley, an experienced captain, decided to alter his route northward to take advantage of the shelter provided by the Ontario shore. The Arthur M. Anderson would be making the same trip and was going to adopt the same strategy. And as night fell and the wind picked up, the great ship battled the waves on Lake Superior. By 1 a.m. on November 10th, McSorley was reporting winds of 96 kilometers an hour and waves up to 3 meters high. Nothing the ship couldn't handle and nothing it hadn't faced before. To be on the safe side, McSorley reduced speed, which surprised Dudley Paquette, the captain of the Wilfred Sykes, who was listening to the radio conversation between the Fitzgerald and Arthur M. Anderson. According to Dudley, McSorley said over the radio, We're going to try for some lee from Isle Royale. You're walking away from us anyway. I can't stay with you. Just one hour later at 2 a.m., the gale warning was upgraded to a storm warning as winds picked up and the waves grew. The ship struggled through the storm but started to pull ahead of the smaller Arthur M. Anderson in their dash for the Ontario coast. The two ships hit the eye of the storm around 3 a.m. and the shifting winds dropped in speed, giving a brief respite to the two ships. The Edmund Fitzgerald continued its journey towards Ontario but the storm was not abating. At 2 p.m. the next day, the Arthur M. Anderson reported heavy snow that reduced visibility, which caused the ship's crew to lose sight of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was now 26 kilometers ahead of them. An hour and a half later, Captain McSorley radioed to the Arthur M. Anderson to alert him that his ship was taking on water. The Edmund Fitzgerald by this point had lost a fence railing and two vent covers to the ceaseless waves of Lake Superior. Taking on water, she was starting to list to the side, while six bilge pumps ran non-stop to discharge water from the hull. Wanting to have another ship close by in case of something happening, Captain McSorley told the Arthur M. Anderson that he would slow down so they could catch up. 40 minutes later, at 4.10 p.m., Captain McSorley once again radioed the Arthur M. Anderson, alerting that he had lost radar and needed their help to keep track of where he was as he was now going blind into the storm. Captain Cooper on the Anderson began to direct McSorley towards Whitefish Bay, where the ship could be sheltered somewhat from the storm. McSorley then radioed the Coast Guard to find if Whitefish Point's light and navigation beacon were operational, but he was told they were both inactive. Over on the Avaforis, the ship was battling the waves nearby and Captain Cedric Woodward heard McSorley tell his crew over the radio not to allow anyone on deck, adding, I have a bad list. I've lost both radars and am taking heavy seas over the deck in one of the worst seas I have ever been in. The storm had no plans of slowing down. Wind speeds on Lake Superior were gusting at 107 kilometers an hour, just below that of a Category 1 hurricane. Waves were between 8 and 10 meters high, slamming into ships but hitting the giant Edmund Fitzgerald especially hard. At 7.10 p.m., Captain Cooper of the Arthur M. Anderson radioed the Edmund Fitzgerald to warn him about an upbound ship heading in his direction and to ask how the ship was faring in the water. Captain McSorley radioed back and said, We are holding our own. And that was it. From then on, the ship would travel through the mists of time and into legend. Nothing was ever heard from the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Queen of the Lakes, ever again. Ten minutes later, Captain Cooper of the Anderson radioed back for a status update. He received no reply. He tried again. Nothing. Captain Anderson looked down at the radar and he saw that the great ship wasn't registering. She had simply vanished into thin air. Captain Cooper knew instantly what had happened. The ship had been claimed by Lake Superior. He said weeks later, The radar, the sea return, the center of the scope was just a white blob, and the Edmund Fitzgerald was disappearing into the sea. The Fitzgerald was no longer on the radar, so Captain Cooper immediately radioed a distress frequency. He contacted the upbound ship, the Nan Free, which was approaching the Fitzgerald's last known position, telling its captain that he could not pick up the Fitzgerald on radar. An hour later, at 9.03 p.m., Captain Cooper reported the ship missing to the Coast Guard. There was no way any of the smaller search and rescue vessels could handle the intense waves of the lake, so Cooper was told to take his ship and look for survivors. An hour and a half later, all vessels in the area around Whitefish Bay were told to assist in the search. This brought out SS William Clay Ford, SS Hilda Marjane, and the Woodrush to join the Anderson in their efforts. 
but there was no trace of the ship. And as the storm passed and the waters of Lake Superior calmed, evidence of the ship finally began to appear. For three days, the Canadian Coast Guard and the Ontario Provincial Police searched the beaches of Lake Superior for any trace of the ship. Along the shoreline and on the lake itself, rafts, lifeboats and a lot of debris were found, but there was no trace of the crew. No one clinging to a life raft, no bodies floating on the water. Gerbenet of the Coast Guard stated, There's a lot of debris, but we haven't found anything that's part of the ship, only things that would have been washed off. We are assuming the ship has sunk. One life raft was found a few days after the Edmund Fitzgerald disappeared, but it was empty. Helicopters flying over reported seeing a large oil slick near its last position. All signs pointed to the complete loss of the ship in the storm. The entire crew of 29 was gone, including 53-year-old Ransom Cundy, the watchman of the ship. He was a former Marine who fought at the Battle of Iwo Jima during the Second World War. John Simmons, aged 62, was the senior wheelman. He was known for his love of jokes, storytelling, and playing pool and been McSorley's close friend for three decades, and this trip on the Edmund Fitzgerald was supposed to be his last. It was, but not in the way he had hoped. Oliver Champeau, aged 41, was the third engineer and had quit school at 13 to raise his four siblings after his father died. He too served with the Marines, but in the Korean War. Robert Rafferty, aged 61, was the cook of the ship. He had spent 30 years on the lakes and often filled in for friends. He wasn't supposed to be on the ship. He was covering for the regular steward who couldn't make the trip. Rafferty was considering retirement when he took that last voyage on the Fitzgerald. The man he replaced, Richard Bishop, had been battling an ulcer for a month. As he was about to board the ship, his condition flared up. Years later, thinking of the loss of his friend and his brush with death, he said, I didn't believe it, I still don't. Joseph Mays, aged 59, was a special maintenance man. He had also spent 30 years working on the Great Lakes and loved what he did. Like several others, he had planned to retire at the end of the 1975 sailing season. Nolan Church, aged 55, was the porter. He didn't start sailing on the Great Lakes until he was in his 40s, after he decided being a crew member on a freighter would be fun. Before he left, he told his son Rick that the Great Lakes didn't have a hole big enough to swallow the Edmund Fitzgerald. He was wrong. There were many others on that ship that fateful November day, from the youngest, Mark Thomas, who was only 21 and working as a deckhand, to the oldest, Captain McSorley, age 62, who, as we know, wanted to retire at the end of the season. Dolores Ulrich, Captain McSorley's daughter, stated, The sea was his life. He loved his boat. It was their company's flagship. His whole life was built around the ship. Families lost husbands, sons, and brothers in the tragedy. The emotional loss was tremendous, and so was the financial loss. Edmund Fitzgerald was the costliest wreck of a single ship in the history of the Great Lakes to that point, at $24 million. Despite having a general location where the ship disappeared, it was unknown where exactly the ship was resting. But it would not take long to find it. Early reports on November 13th, four days after the storm, suspected the Edmund Fitzgerald to be at the bottom of Lake Superior. After sonar equipment was brought in, a spokesman with the Coast Guard stated, While the ship hasn't positively been identified, we are pretty certain it's a Fitzgerald. The next day, there was confirmation that the Edmund Fitzgerald was found 24 kilometers west of Dead Man's Cove, Ontario, 161 meters under the water on the Canadian side of the border. On November 17th in Toledo, Ohio, 450 people, including friends and family of the crew, attended a memorial. Nearby at the Bayview Naval Armory, a service was held with a trumpeter playing taps, and over the resting spot of the ship a wreath was placed by a Coast Guard vessel. And while the family of those lost struggle to deal with the loss, the rest of the world turned their attention to determining just the reason for its sinking. A few days after the ship sank, a preliminary report was released. Based on the scans done of the ship at the lake's bottom, it was determined she had broken into two pieces. It was believed the Fitzgerald had suffered a broken security railing and was taking on water through open vents before she sank. It would take years before any more information could be retrieved, but most believed it was a complete structural failure from a large wave hitting the ship. From May 20th to 28th, 1976, the US Navy sent an unmanned submersible down to the wreck site. 
It discovered that the bow section was sitting upright in the lake mud 52 meters away from the stern section. That section of the ship was at a 50 degree angle from the bow. The iron ore cargo was scattered over a wide area of the lake bottom. In the preliminary inquiry, Lieutenant William Paul of the Marine Inspection Office testified that prior to leaving on its last journey, an inspection found four hatches that had small fractures caused by loading and unloading cargo. He said, It was nothing serious enough to hold the vessel for major repairs. In 1977, a report theorized that the sinking was caused by ineffective hatch closures. The ceaseless crashing of the waves on the ship caused water to pour into the open hatches. The report stated that in the hours leading up to the sinking, the water pouring into the hatches caused a slow but fatal loss of the ship's buoyancy. But the families of the lost crew and several labor organizations criticized this theory, stating it was a slur on the honor of Captain McSorley. They stated he never would have allowed hatches to be open in a storm, especially with his decades of experience. In 1980, Jean-Michel Casteau, the son of famed ocean explorer Jacques Casteau, took the first manned submersible down to the ship. Looking at the ship, he believed she broke up on the surface rather than as she sank beneath the waves of Lake Superior. And for the next 15 years, various expeditions have gone to the wreck to determine how the ship was lost. And from these expeditions, various theories have emerged. Almost immediately after the Edmund Fitzgerald sank, blame was levied against the National Weather Service, who predicted the storm would travel south of Lake Superior. That belief was also one reason the ship set sail rather than waiting out the storm. There were also issues found with navigational charts, which were incredibly out of date, with most of the information coming from surveys done in 1916 and 1919. Subsequent surveys have found that there was a shoal that ran 1.6 kilometers farther east than was shown on charts. If the ship made it to that shoal, it likely would have floundered during the storm. Along with blame, theories abounded over why the ship broke apart either on the surface or as it sank. Through simulations with conditions of 80 km per hour winds, it was discovered that every one out of 100 waves reached 11 meters in height and every one in 1,000 waves reached 14 meters in height. These large waves, hitting the ship moving east-southeast, would have caused the Edmund Fitzgerald to roll heavily. The possibility of a rogue wave was also raised. These waves, while rare, are highly destructive. They are much higher than the other waves around them and have a history of sinking ships. At least 14 rogue waves hit ships in the 20th century and 7 in the 21st century. According to the hypothesis, three rogue waves, known as the Three Sisters, hit the Edmund Fitzgerald in the storm. Each was believed to be 33% higher than normal waves. If three of those waves hit the ship in succession, they would have caused immense damage. Under this theory, the first wave flooded the deck. Before the water drained, the second wave hit, adding more water by the time the third wave hit. Water would have put too much pressure and weight on the deck, causing structural failure of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The rogue wave theory was backed up by Captain Cooper of the Arthur M. Anderson. He stated in his logs that his ship was hit by two 30 to 35 foot seas about 6.30 p.m one burying the aft cabins and damaging a lifeboat by pushing it right down onto the saddle. The second wave of this size, perhaps 35 feet, came over the bridge deck. In an official report, he added, Then the Anderson just raised up and shook herself off of all that water. The roof. Just like a big dog. Another wave, just like that first one or bigger, hit us again. I watched those two waves head down the lake towards the Fitzgerald, and I think those were the two that sent him under. Anderson added there was possibly a third wave that hit his ship and then continued in the direction of the Edmund Fitzgerald around the same time the ship sank. Why would the three waves have sunk the Edmund Fitzgerald and not the Arthur M. Anderson? Well, it comes down to the fact that the Edmund Fitzgerald was already listing heavily and moving slowly. Its position in the water relative to the waves would have also played a contributing factor to their destructive power. Further to the structural failure hypothesis, it was believed modifications to the ship's winter load line, which is where the hull of the ship meets the surface of the water, may have allowed those larger waves to cause a stress fracture in the hull. Frederick Stonehouse, a maritime historian, stated in 1989 upon viewing video of an underwater survey of the Edmund Fitzgerald that he believed after the hull fractured, the stern floated on the surface for a short time and spilled its cargo into the lake. 
If this was the case, the two halves of the ship did not sink at the same time. There were likely some of the crew on that floating half who saw the other half plunge into the depths of the lake, and they knew their part of the ship was next. The families of the crew launched several lawsuits against Northwestern Mutual and its operators. Two widows sued for $1.5 million, while an additional $2.1 million lawsuit was filed later by other families of the crew. Eventually, the company paid compensation for an undisclosed amount on condition of confidentiality, 12 months in advance of the official findings of the probable cause for the sinking. The loss of the Fitzgerald also resulted in new recommendations to shipping practices on the Great Lakes for both Canada and the United States. Survival suits were now required in crew quarters with strobe lights fixed onto life jackets so crew could be spotted easily in the water at night. In 1980, the Loran Sea positioning system was implemented on ships to provide satellite positioning on the Great Lakes. This was upgraded to GPS in the 1990s. All Great Lake vessels also had to be equipped with an emergency positioning indicating radio beacon for accurate location information in the event of a disaster. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration also revised its methods for predicting wave heights, while the navigational charts for Lake Superior were all updated to provide greater accuracy and detail. Today, all U.S. ships heading out into the Great Lakes as November approaches have their hatch and vent closures and life-saving equipment inspected to ensure there will be no problems when the ship heads out. There have been many tributes for the lost crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The ship's bell, which I mentioned, was retrieved and engraved with the names of the 29 men lost in the disaster. An anchor from the ship that was lost on an earlier trip is now on display at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum in Detroit. Several other artifacts have also been collected and placed in museums along Lake Superior on both sides of the international border. In 2015, the Royal Canadian Mint commemorated the Edmund Fitzgerald with a silver coin. But there is one tribute that eclipses them all. In late 1975, Canadian singer-songwriter Gordon Lightfoot was reading Newsweek when he came across the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Reading of the crew's death inspired him, but he also saw the ship's name had been misspelled with an O in Edmund instead of a U. Lightfoot felt this disrespected the dead, and he wanted to fix that. He put pen to paper and crafted The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. As he wrote the lyrics, Lightfoot was afraid he would get something about the disaster wrong. Agonizing over the lyrics, his friend and lead guitarist, Terry Clements, told him to do what Mark Twain would do, just tell a story. With that, Lightfoot completed the song and went to a recording studio at 48 Yorkville Avenue in Toronto to record it. That recording studio is now gone, and as that other ditty goes, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Lightfoot's Ode to the Fitz was released in August 1976 on the album Summertime Dream. Despite being six minutes long, it was a massive hit and one of the biggest Lightfoot ever had in his career. It went to number one in Canada on the top singles, adult contemporary, and country charts. It reached number two on the US Billboard Hot 100, number nine on the Billboard Easy Listening chart, and number one on the US Cashbox Top 100. By the end of 1976, it was the 12th biggest song in Canada. And when Lightfoot died in May 2023, the song once again went up the charts, reaching number 20 on the US Hot Rock and Alternative Songs chart. Of all his songs, Lightfoot considered The Wreck of the Evan Fitzgerald to be his finest. Every year, on the anniversary of the Edmund Fitzgerald sinking, the Mariner's Church in Detroit rings its bell 29 times for each man lost. On May 2, 2023, the day after the death of Gordon Lightfoot, the bell was rung 29 times, plus one more, for the man who helped immortalize the disaster in the minds and hearts of so many. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufor. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. 
and there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com. Or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.